Take a moment to mentally transport yourself to a symphony. Various musical notes greet your ears as musicians tune their instruments. The murmurs and distant laughs of the audience create a buzz of background noise. The conductor makes an entrance from the left of the stage, and applause erupts from the audience. The musicians all end their tuning and shuffle their papers. As the conductor raises his hands, the crowd silences, and the first movement begins. When neurons come together, they create a symphony of activity that creates a conscious experience of love, pain, and cognition. But can we listen in on these neural concertos? What technologies make this possible, and how do they work? Hey, I'm Harrison Canning, and in this video, we are going to discuss the different types of neurotech, such as invasive, semi-invasive, and non-invasive, and discuss the components of a brain-computer interface. Neurotechnologies can be represented by a variety of terms, neuromodulation, neuroimaging, neurofeedback, and brain-computer interfaces, which are sometimes also called brain-machine interfaces. As you will see, neurotechnology is a diverse field with lots of different subsets and applications. Here are some generalizations of non-invasive, semi-invasive, and invasive forms of neurotech that we will present to you in the form of a symphony in your mind. Non-invasive neurotechnology is entirely outside of your brain and body. It is like listening to a large symphony behind the closed doors of a lobby. The sound is muffled, but you can hear the major movements of the music when it gets louder or softer, faster or slower. You may not be able to make out the songs as easily as if you were in the audience, but you can gauge the mood of the music. You can walk to different doors to get a different perspective, but you can't get into the room, so it could be clearer. So your experience could be better, but hey, at least you didn't have to pay or get dressed up, right? The first and most commonly used of the non-invasive BCIs is the electroencephalogram, shortened to EEG. EEG records electrical activity by placing electrodes on the scalp. One of the main advantages of EEG is that it delivers information in real time. This means that it has good temporal resolution. EEG is comparatively cheap and portable, which makes it a good first stop in our neurotech journey. There are plenty of consumer devices that you can buy right now for only a few hundred dollars to begin experimenting with your brainwaves. One drawback to using EEG is it has low spatial resolution. Spatial resolution refers to the smallest possible area that you can accurately discern data from. It increases as the individual sample area goes down, like the resolution of a computer monitor. This occurs because EEG signals are scrambled by the skull and several other biological layers. The maximum spatial resolution of EEG is about 6 to 8 centimeters squared, which is about the size of a US half dollar coin. We can see how we are limited in our accuracy because we can imagine how many neurons can fit into this area, tens of millions in the cortex. EEGs are excellent at detecting brain waves and the overall state of the brain, and can offer insight into the wearer's current emotional state. fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, is another commonly used non-invasive neurotechnology which measures blood flow in the brain to gather its signals. This information is then overlaid onto a brain model by MRI. The more blood flow an area has, the more likely it is to be activated and used in a certain task. fMRI has much better spatial resolution than EEG, but temporal resolution is low, meaning it's more precise but takes longer to process. This makes it more useful in research than for interface control, which requires more immediate feedback. Unfortunately, fMRI needs large and expensive equipment to work. However, the benefits of high spatial resolution and safety have meant that fMRI has provided researchers with deep insight into how the brain functions, producing some beautiful images along the way. FNIRS, which stands for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy, hopes to achieve a middle ground between EEG and fMRI. The technology is based on the absorption of near-infrared light by hemoglobin in the blood. It uses a spectrum of light which passes through skin, tissue, and bone, but is absorbed by the blood. FNIRS combines the portability of EEG with the higher spatial resolution of other neurotechnologies. Like fMRI, blood flow is used to assess the location and intensity of activity. Its main advantages are that it is portable, cheaper than fMRI, and a lot less susceptible to electrical noise. 
These are some examples of the non-invasive neurotechnologies that you may encounter. Non-invasive neurotechnology is great for applications where high speed, low cost, low risk, and ease of use is required. If we want to gain more signal clarity, however, we will need to go underneath the skull where semi-invasive neurotech resides. Semi-invasive technology is placed underneath the skull, but doesn't penetrate the cells. To clarify, let's go back to our symphony example. With semi-invasive neurotechnology, you are a member of the audience. You can hear and engage with the music, you can hear the songs more clearly, and you might even hum along. If you really focus, you might be able to discern between one section or another, but you can't make out the music of any individual musician. As a member of the audience, you may even clap or holler for an encore, which may extend the performance when others join in, but you alone won't have much of an effect. The best example of semi-invasive neurotechnology is electrocorticography, or ECOG. ECOG is similar to EEG in that it measures electrical activity generated by the neurons using electrodes. However, unlike EEG, electrodes are placed directly on the brain's surface. ECOG can be used in long-term brain monitoring or for interface control where higher accuracy and more permanency is needed. It can also be used as a non-specific stimulatory technology, making it effective for the treatment of certain diseases. This is the only semi-invasive device that we will talk about for now, but I can't stress its importance enough. ECOG is often used as a compromise between non-invasive and invasive alternatives and is used in a wide variety of applications. Finally, let's talk about fully invasive BCIs. Invasive neurotechnology penetrates into the brain, allowing data to be collected much closer to the neurons themselves. Now, you're a violinist in the symphony. You can hear the overall orchestra, but the sound is dwarfed by your violin. You may exert greater influence over an individual section by changing the notes you play to go against or with the orchestra. Invasive BCIs are typically used for more advanced applications such as prosthetic control or communication devices for individuals in locked-in states. Many invasive recording techniques use arrays of needle-shaped microelectrodes placed into the brain. The signals produced by these electrodes are typically very good. They are only marginally affected by noise and are very detailed. Each electrode implanted using this technique measures electrical activity of one or very few neurons directly, which can be incredibly good for getting detailed signals from specific areas of the brain. Unlike EEG or ECOG, you can access signals from deeper structures within the brain. One limitation of invasive recording tools is that they currently only are useful for a few years before brain scarring degrades signal quality. However, new innovations are creating more targeted electrodes coated in biocompatible materials that may last much longer. Elon Musk's Neuralink is working on a device which has been demonstrated to implant upwards of a thousand electrodes individually, increasing longevity and accuracy. Because you are penetrating the brain, these technologies are currently quite expensive and pose more risk, although this varies considerably between types of implants. Invasive BCIs are also very powerful in their ability to stimulate the brain. Deep brain stimulation, for example, is an invasive neurostimulation device widely used for the treatment of movement and memory disorders such as Parkinson's disease. It requires implanting of electrodes in specific parts of the brain, which send electrical pulses to influence the neural firing in those target areas. Similarly, implanted electrodes are routinely used in medicine to stimulate certain areas of the brain for treatment of epilepsy. Implanted electrodes have been used in visual prosthetics, which, when combined with an external camera, can create a visual feed directly to the brain using an electrode array planted into the visual centers of the brain. But how exactly are brain-computer interfaces designed? Well, there are three common components that most devices use. These components broadly handle the processes of signal acquisition, data processing, and the generation of an action. In the case of an EEG-based BCI, signals are acquired through electrodes placed on the scalp, which can be made from different conductive materials. Sometimes, a fluid or paste will be used to increase conductivity. The signal is then sent through a wire to the brain-computer interface. Once the signals are collected, they will be amplified and filtered to clean up the data. EEG electrodes are really sensitive and can pick up interference from other devices, muscle movements, and even nearby power lines, so various filters are used to clean up the data. Next, 
the info is passed through a computer algorithm that tries to determine the intention of the user by comparing real-time data to stored data. Certain algorithms are then used to determine if a task should be executed by the computer system. These tasks range from driving robotic prosthetics to driving wheelchairs, or the data can be used for study or medical diagnoses. These processes are generally called pre-processing and filtering, which will be covered in more depth in later lessons. In this video, we learned about the types of BCIs and their components. But how are these BCIs used in research and medicine? And can they be used for the general consumer? Check in with the next video to find out.